If, when you have a list, put that at the top of your list. That's number one priority. And that spoke to me so much. And we went to a service down in, in Petersburg, Virginia. And I had, an, I had a touch from God greater than I've ever experienced in my entire life still to this day. I walked into that church and they started singing, I exalt thee. And I just looked it up that day, what it meant. And I was like, God, I know what I'm singing. And I started to be desperate to get God at the top of my list. He, he was there and he would go. He was there and he would go. He was there and I was learning how to make him Lord of my life, man. And I was young in my faith. I was still, I think I just became an intern. And we started singing that song. And I remember going up to the front of the church for prayer. I was teary out to barely see where I was going. And all of a sudden, I opened my eyes. It was like... 6 o'clock when we started. When I opened my eyes, it was like almost 10 o'clock. The whole church was empty. And there was one guy sitting on the front pew, weeping and crying, saying, God, touch my buddy. God, touch my buddy. He was just weeping, man, as I laid there. And God, the power of the Holy Ghost hit me. When I got to the front of that church, man, and I just began to weep. I had an overdose of the power of God. Fell out, man. And, and here's what that church said. There was a revival that started at that church that went for a long time. And I said, Leah, because she worked on our campus in the front office. I said, Leah, what happened there, man? She said, you walked up, fell out in the spirit and was weeping and you were speaking in your heavenly language. I said, I don't remember a bit of that. I just know I had an encounter with the Lord, man. She said, here's the thing our church did. We had a meeting about four weeks ago and we said we need to be desperate for a move of God. She said, so for the last four weeks, we've been fasting and praying and believing. And I said, that's what we've been praying for too. And they didn't even know it. And I said, we've been fasting and praying. And I said, today I looked up what exalt means. And I said, God, help me to do that. We get in here and God said, here's your chance. I exalt thee. And I ran up front. I, I didn't care what anybody thought, man. I ran up front and was desperate for him. Oh, with me. Yeah. And I'm ashamed to say this. That, that great of a move of God in my life. I remember getting on the bus with all those guys and I jumped on and was like, my life is different. And I'm shouting. They're just like, what happened to you, man? And I'm like, I don't know. It's just better than any drug, any anything, man. I feel accepted and loved and rejected. I mean, all of it's gone. I feel, I feel light. I feel like I can see over the wheel of the car for the first time in my life. Like, I feel huge. I feel so good, man. Uh, they're looking at me like I was crazy, man. But, but man, a revival started to move from that experience. And the very thing that I said separately and that that whole church said, we made a decision to be desperate for a move and a touch from God. Now, I'm ashamed to say, why do I ever go through life again without that motive and without that heart? Because we let darkness creep in sometimes. And we let it, we let it cloud us. Or we're desperate for an answer, but not from God sometimes. Let me ask you this question. Are you trying to run your own life? What areas of your life are you trying to run on your own? Are you allowing someone else to run your life for you? You can follow a man. And, 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 and Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. But there's going to be a time if you follow me and put me on a pedestal, I could let you down. I might miss something. I might forget something. I might, I, I, I might let you down. Not on purpose. But I'm human, I'm fallible, man. Who, who are you looking to? Who's running your life, man? Maybe, maybe, maybe we're bowing to the enemy so many times and allowing darkness to rule our lives. That Cheryl, that's what we were talking about, just being down and, and being clouded and not seeing, letting the enemy determine, letting this darkness determine my attitude and the way that I am. And I'm guilty of that at times. Because I'm human. But on any given day, at any given moment, someone is on the throne of your life. All the time. Someone has to be on the throne. Because God said we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. That means we're in a kingdom with the king that needs to be on the throne, man. Someone is calling the shots. Again, it doesn't mean we're helpless. We have no say in the direction of our lives. It means that the one who is on the throne of our lives is the one we're looking to for help and direction. And being desperate to be in his presence. Who do you look for for help with your life? Who do you look to help you with decisions you need to make in your life? Who do you think sits on the throne most in your life? I'm not asking you. These are questions that I wrote for me today, man. Who do you think sits on the throne most of your life? My natural answer, if you know me, anybody that knows me knows I'm going to say Jesus. God sits on the throne. 
There's times, man, I'm my own worst enemy and I can get in my head if I'm not careful. It's either yourself, it's God, it's another person or people, or it's the enemy of our soul. Why was Elijah hiding in the cave wanting to commit suicide? Because he said the people. What wasn't Jezebel. Jezebel was one after him. He didn't even say Jezebel. He said the people more than once in his response to God. He was like people rule his life. Where he's in a cave and depressed and darkness came over him. And he wanted to die. Why? Because the people. I, I, I can tell you at least ten pastors that have committed suicide in the last year. Why? People. They let it creep in and cause a darkness to come over them. And they started feeling less about themselves and invaluable to the point where they take their life. Serious, man. God was on the throne in their life. I know He was at one time. I'm not saying they did anything intentionally. But somewhere they started letting the, the opinion of people rule, be on the throne. And it affected them to the point where they took their own life, man. It breaks me. It literally breaks me. To know that that's going on, man, it kills me. It's just deception. The enemy, man, creeps in and he says things. He can step out of the darkness of our life, man, and make it next to impossible. But it's 100% possible because you're not alone. You're never alone. God is always with you. We're able to take this step out of darkness because God has already rescued us from the power of darkness in our lives. That's a promise. That's the good news of the gospel. God has to be on the throne in our lives, though. He has to be on the throne for us to be delivered continually from the power of darkness. I can't say, God, I need you right now because things are bad. But when things get better, I'm going to determine where I work and where I go and how much money I make if I witness or not, I'm going to determine all that. Whether we whether we put God on the throne or not depends on whether we continue to walk free of darkness. And I put all me on that one, man. Uh, we need to give up control of our lives. Why is it so hard? Who in here likes to have control? Uh, thank y'all for being honest, man. I figured I'd have like half a hand. We're getting it, man. We're starting to get it. Why do we feel like we need to be in control? We don't trust God that He's in control. Why do I feel like I need to control the situation at hand, man? Because I don't feel like God's big enough to have control. God, maybe He won't speak to me. Maybe I just need to do it on my own. God's big enough and He's with me. He'll never leave me or forsake me. I gotta be desperate to hear Him. I gotta be desperate to get close to Him, man. We have to give up control of our lives and ask God to help us step out of the darkness. We need God's help in doing this, man. The Bible talks about a wide path and a narrow path. And he says, man, that, that, that God's Word tells us that there's two. One path has a wide gate. One path has a narrow gate. And the narrow gate requires help in order to go through it, but it leads to light. The path with the wide gate doesn't require any help, but it leads to destruction, man. So enter by the narrow gate, Scripture says. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, but the gate that is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Those who are find it are few. Are few, it says in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. The narrow path is where God is king. The narrow path is when God is on the throne, and this path leads to His kingdom. It leads to freedom. The wide path is where God is not given place of king in our lives. So when we're on that wide path, that means God isn't king at the moment. I understand what I'm saying. That leads to destruction. I know it can sound harsh, but consider that God goes through extreme measures to make this truth known to us. He sent His Son to be beaten and brutalized and die a death that we have never even can fathom how bad it was. He sent His innocent Son to go through that because He was desperate to have a relationship with us and let us know that we could walk free continually of this darkness. That not one person who comes to Christ has to fall away or miss out or be less than or not get receive the gifts of the Spirit or anything else because it says that that's for each one that are in the body. So why isn't everybody operating in the gifts of the Spirit? Why isn't everybody speaking life? Why isn't everybody being baptized? Why isn't everybody experiencing what God said we would experience? The Bible says God will keep you in perfect peace. If your mind stays on Him because you trusted Him. Why don't we have perfect peace then? Because we ain't desperate enough to have our minds, train our minds to stay on Jesus. That's right. We ain't desperate enough to say, God, I have to seek you continually or else my peace is going. It's a promise in your word. 
give us the remedy. But we like to have control. This is my time. This is my free time, God. This is my time to relax with my... God says, man, it's in your desk with me. You don't even know what perfect peace is. I want that for you. And I want that for me at this point in my ministry more than anything I've ever wanted in my life. To be free, totally free of this darkness. Not get it, get a little emotional tune up, and then fall back into your old habits. Not any of that. But to really get it, to be able to walk out of this darkness where God is king. You're on the narrow path, and it says it's hard, and it's tough, and those who find it are few. But it leads to life. It leads to life. Girls, y'all want to have life, guys. Y'all want to have life, man. This is what we have to do. If you've never trusted God with your life and you'd like to make that decision today, you can make that decision. But if you've already made it, we got to give God full control of our lives. That's about surrender. If someone comes up to me at the ATM and puts a gun in my back, what am I going to do? My mind, I'd Bruce Lee kick him cheap, take that gun and, and say today I bring him right down to him. Like, here you go, cheap, with his hand put up behind his back. Realistically, what am I probably going to do? Oh, hold up. Hold up. I'm not coming. Hold up. It's surrender. At that point, it's total surrender, man. Even if it's just for that moment, it's total surrender. God says, that's what I want. He doesn't have a gun to all that. He just wants you to do it willingly. He's saying, come to me. It leads to life. There's a river that can be flowing out of your belly, man, that leads to life. Everything you come around will come to life. Everything you touch will come to life. Your business will come to life. Your marriage will come to life. Your children will come to life. Everything you do will come to life. But you got to get desperate for Jesus first before it will come to life. When you do that, man, God. Oh. It's absolutely amazing, man. This goes against everything the world says because it says you have to, we have to admit we're weak and we need help. Everywhere I go, a man says, we're not weak and we don't need help. We can do it. You might be able to do something, but you're going to reach a lid and you may never go reach your potential in Jesus. Ever. You might be smart or talented. Those are all gifts from God anyway. You might have business mindset. Those are all gifts from God anyway. So you can do it on your own and you'll hit a lid real quick and you'll probably do the same thing for 40 years. Or you can say, God, I'm putting you with it as the king of my life. I'm trusting you. And you might do the same thing, but there's going to be so much light. It don't matter if you're selling selling roses under the Wellsville Bridge down there or whatever you're doing, man. Whatever it is. You're going to be able to see life everywhere that you go when you put God. Because He didn't create us to live apart from Him or hide from people. God didn't create me to hide. God didn't create me to tuck away and isolate and hide when things are going bad. That's not what He made me for. But so many times that's what we go to. We all have our go-to, man. We hide from God and other people, man. God's plan is for us to trust Him, depend on Him, and allow Him to direct our steps. I don't have to hide if He's directing my steps. This is the narrow path that's full of life. Keep in mind that God's all-knowing, man. He knows you. He knows your life. He loves you just the way you are right now. But He loves you enough not to let you live in His kingdom and not be on a destructive path. He loves you enough to cause you to, to, to see the need for Him. And He shows us all in Scripture that we read and sang about today. Those are all about a desperate need for Jesus. Painful experiences are only one way to darkness in our life when we get in our mind. It can also, it can also come about the way that we think about ourselves, man. As I said, we think about our life. We think about other people. We can become blind to God, what God's Word says about us. Let me ask you something, man. How many people could say, if this isn't, I'm just asking you. How many people study, really, really study what the Word of God says about who you are? And I look at girls and the, and the guys, you have to. How many really study about who you are? I want to encourage you to do that, man. Because when those lies come in, I need some. I have a wife that tells me who I am. I have individuals that encourage me, man. I, I have like Kathy and Mike. One of the first, one of the first time we really, really talked. They were encouraging me about something, and I would joke about something. But down deep, there was a slight belief that that was some truth to that. And they confronted me a lot in a bad way, in a very loving and smiling way. They said, "Man, we're here. This is that." And, Man, that's not you. I needed a reminder that what, what the Word of God says about me in that moment, man. I needed that. We need that for each other. That was life at that moment. I needed that reminder, man. So we all need that. Our minds can become full of darkness because of the type of thoughts that we have. Now listen to this. There's a couple lies from the enemy that are common, man. It's never going to get better. Have you ever believe that lie? 
My life's never going to change. It just is what it is, man. Nothing I do really is going to make a difference in my life. God doesn't really love me because look at what I'm going through. It's too late. I've done too much. That was my, my whole life. It's too late. Dad, you don't understand what I've done. I can't serve God and be like you now and park my ear to the side and carry a Bible everywhere I go and wear a three-piece suit. I can't do it. I got tattoos and stuff. I can't dress like that. I can't live like that. I was a lie that was in my mind, man. I, I can't do it like you. God didn't want me to do it like him. He wanted me to do it like he's taught me to do it, man. So I was, I was believing several lies in the time. I didn't even know it. I don't need God to change my life. Some people say that. The enemy doesn't really exist. It's not that serious, y'all. It's not that serious. It's not that things are going okay. I'm not really seeking them now. It's not that serious. I'm ugly. I'm fat. I'm skinny. No way loves me. My life's a failure. All these things are lies that come into our mind. And when I, begin, when I begin to think about what I'm thinking about and the thoughts that I've had about myself, man, it can be a little shocking. Because I started to write them out just over the years. How many lives? I thought, I don't really struggle with this that bad. i got two pages full of them. Right, this, I'm like, whoa, this is coming at me this time. I thought this, this is under my mind. And it was absolutely amazing, man. It was shocking how many things have come into my mind over the years from the enemy or from people that try to derail me from having God as king in my life and fully trust in him. That's not who I am, God. I am who you say I am. I just know I felt bad a long time. About my entire life, and I tried to look okay on the outside, but inside it wasn't okay. This is what we have to change, man. What about you, man? What do you think about the lies that you've been told uh, about your life? You ever been treated bad in a relationship, man? And some of those words that have come at you have stuck a little bit, and they sting a little bit if you think about them, man. We have to get rid of that darkness and say, God, that wasn't that wasn't your truth, or that wasn't the narrow path that was destructive, man. How do you think those lies have impacted your life? Our emotions and our feelings can be really difficult to identify. Many of us aren't aware of our feelings, man. Many of us have turned to things to try to block out our feelings because our feelings are painful. Getting in touch with our feelings can be very difficult for a variety of reasons, man. This is the place where we start the journey to allow God to help our feelings, man. He knows what's caused the pain in your life. He knows everything about you. He knows what you're feeling at this very moment, and He loves you, man. He loves you. So you got to get your thought life right. You gotta get the darkness out of there about yourself and everything else, man. There's some emotions that you might have to get rid of that I had. Depression, loneliness, helplessness, hopelessness, fear, anxiety, guilt, shame. Anybody relate to any of these? All the other. Rage, self-hatred, feeling rejected, self-loathing, all of them. These are things that come in that are distortions that cause us to remove God from the throne and think that, that, man, this word that's been said to me or this thought is ruling my life. It's darkness. But you see how slick the enemy is. I didn't even realize how much of an issue it could be until I started studying this afternoon <coughs> and writing some of this stuff out. And I was like, whoa, whoa. I literally have 20 more that I could name that I've experienced since I've been saved, man. And, and the next thing that we look at it in the next five minutes is just actions or behaviors, man. It's the things that we do that bring pain. The things that we do is actions, man. It's difficult to face these things. But it can be anything from overeating to gambling to alcohol to drugs to misuse of prescription drugs, pornography, sexual sin, workaholics. That's an action or a behavior, man, that causes destruction because you spend so much time. That money is your king. I know people right now that are doing it. They work and work and work and work. And then when they're done working, they work some more. They don't have time to give anybody any life-giving words because they're too busy working. Because they have to have a certain status or dollar amount, man. That can be a, a, a thing that brings darkness into your life. Lying, gossiping, overspending. Uh. <laughs> We'll make a comment, but I, I'm probably the one to overspend more than anybody, man. But uh, we get a lot of Amazon packages for sure, <laughs> daily, man. And late nights when you can't sleep, and it's just yeah, like, oh, that looks good, that looks good. And I get like a hamster wheel of four other things delivered. I'm like, I don't even know why I ordered this. Or what happened? Overspending. What could I be doing with some of that, man? That could bless my family or somebody else. Over exercising, man. Get to the point where it's obsessive because you feel like that's where identity comes from. Yelling, temper, controlling behavior, isolation, people pleasing. Anybody relate to any of those? Uh, it's not easy to look at these things in our life and in our hearts that are dark. 
It takes courage to face the pain and the sin, but it takes knowledge to know the truth, to pull out of it. And this is just one way the enemy works in our life. Satan doesn't want us to know the truth about Christ. He wants us to believe that our pain and sin is bigger than Christ. That your situation is bigger. He wants you to think that your pain and your sin is not that big a deal. One of the two. And those are the two ways we believe so many times. That pain or that thing is bigger than anything else that can come in my life. It's bigger than Jesus. Or He wants us to think that, man, that sin is not that big a deal. We either get nonchalant and casual about it, or we think that God's not big enough. Instead of being in that perfect place in the middle where you say, God, I don't want to be stagnant. I don't want to be nonchalant when it comes to serving you and casual. Uh, but I also know that this isn't too big that you can't help me out of it. That's, that's the narrow path that God wants us on. If Satan can convince you that your bondage is too big, your secrets are too shameful, your pain is too great, you won't believe that change is possible. You're not really going to believe it down in your being. You give up trying without a fight and you go onto the broad path, man. But if you believe that your pain and bondage is not that big a deal, you're never going to ask for God's help and you're never going to get desperate. You're set, you'll settle for a little darkness in your heart and miss out on experiencing greater freedom. My heart tonight, man, is, to, is, is to, to, to thwart the lies and the pain of the enemy that keeps us away from the healing power of Christ with his weapon, which is deception. I want everybody tonight, man, on the sound of my voice, to know, man, that we're not going to be deceived anymore, to make a declaration that we're not going to be deceived anymore. That God's going to be God. He's going to be on the throne. Not a thought that I have is going to rule my life. Not an emotion that I have is going to rule my life. Not a behavior that I have is going to rule my life. Man, I was told I was bipolar and everything else. That ruled me for years. That was my king. That's why I flipped out and acted angry, man, because I believed that it was my king. Until I met King Jesus and He said, that's not who you are. You just don't know how to manage your emotions rightly. There's two truths. God loves you and will never leave you. The second one is Christ defeated the enemy of the cross. Two scriptures before we pray. It says, I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to be will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That says nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Nothing can. Not a thought. Not, not an action. Nothing I can do can separate me from the love of Christ. He loves me. He pursues me. He wants me to desperately seek Him. I'll ever see a line. The Bible says that Satan goes about like a roaring lion, seeking who he made about like a roaring lion. He's a mouthpiece. But how many times, man, do we let that roaring lion become king and stop us from pursuing God or believing in truth or standing on truth? Yeah. Many times. And, and if you ever see a lion taste blood, they're relentless. They team up. They tear that thing apart until it's gone. And he's pursuing me like that. I gotta be relentless in my pursuit towards God. Otherwise, man, he catches up to me. As long as I stay desperate and relentless in my pursuit of Almighty God to be king of my life, Satan has no chance in doing anything in my life, defeating me in any way in my thought life or anywhere else. That's right, brother. And the other scripture says it's Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15. And it says, And you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by the canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Hear this. This He set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them open and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. You hear that, man? It says every... The legal demand, the law that said we owed a debt that we couldn't pay. Law demanded we pay our debt, our sin debt. But it says Jesus came down and He disarmed that, that authority that says we have to pay. He disarmed it, man. And every bit of legal demand that came with it. And He said He, he disarmed rulers and, and authorities. What, what are we up against in Ephesians 6? Rulers and authorities of this world, man. It says He disarmed them. He disarmed Satan. He took his keys. He took his authority. He took the ability to, 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 to keep us captive. And he says he put it to shame openly. 
triumphing over them on the cross. It's that our attitude that Jesus, because you tried them, because you're good, because you did this, man, I'm going to desperately and relentlessly seek you every day of my life. Because when we do that, we're guaranteed that the enemy is going to be put to shame and stay there. But if we don't, man, we end up trying to fulfill the requirements in our own doing. And it's sad, but I see it every day. I see it among pastors. I see it among friends. I see it among family. I see it when I look in the mirror at times. Yeah, we got to be free of this and be able to walk in the free, the true freedom that God gives. As we sang that song, Jubilee, we was talking about there was true joy in His freedom. And I'm praying as I'm getting ready to speak the Spirit, saying, God, let me preach something different. Give me something different. I want to preach something different. I don't want to face this any more than anybody else does. We started singing that song, There is True Joy and Freedom. And I was like, oh, man, God, you're confirming to me so much that if I'll seek you and I'm relentless and I get on my face before you and every opportunity that I have to seek you, I'm taking advantage of it. If I do that, I'm going to have true joy in that freedom. Man, let me ask you this in closing. Will you ignore the battle? Will you ignore the battle? You ignore the battle. You try to fight it in your own strength. Or you rely on the power of Christ to fight the battle for you. And I, I know it's easy to say the right thing. But I want you to really reflect for just a minute. And as we close our eyes, I want you to really reflect.